pleasure to everybody welcome to episode of Polygamy Street. I'm your community ambassador, Mr. Robin J. Anderson. I'm gonna give my disclaimer first, all right? Polygamy Street is not believe in those and podcast. We're here for information purpose only, all right? On Polygamy Street, we interview business owners, community leaders, and our legislative officials. So for those who probably aren't from Houston that's gonna that's gonna watch this interview, uh, if you don't know this, this gentleman sitting next to me, this is the honorable Julian Boney. Thank you so much. <laughs> First of all, thanks, thanks for you know, uh, blessing my podcast with your presence, man. Because it's like, you know, you have such an extensive background, I'm going to say like that, you know, that I think that a lot of people uh, need to need to hear and see who and what you are, right? So uh, a little bit what I do is I get a background, like where you, where where'd you grow up? Well, I was born during segregation. Okay. In uh, 1951. And uh, Temple, Texas. Temple, Texas. Okay. All right. And my father, the only child, mm-hmm. took my mother to the hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, it was segregated. Mm-hmm. And they told my father, and it my mother, that we don't. Uh, you know, treat Negroes here. This is, this is in Temple, Texas? In Temple, Texas. Wow. In 1951. Mm-hmm. And uh, they told my father and Judah Bowie, Judah, mm-hmm. Sidney, that uh, we could uh, take us somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, to the, you know, maybe to Austin. <clears throat> Austin is 90 miles away. Goodness, bro. Told the diet. And my father said, No, I'm not going anywhere. And they stunned and said, uh, hmm. The audacity, right? <laughs> <laughs> They never had that experience before. Right, 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 right. And so they wanted to have a little meeting. Mm-hmm. From the back end, said, okay. We will uh, we'll treat it here. And they, uh, but not, not up here in the hospital, but mm-hmm. in the basement mm-hmm. of the, that was unfinished, mm-hmm. that they were preparing mm-hmm. to be part of this. So I was uh, in the basement of the Undeveloped hospital in Temple, Texas. Wow. No 16, 19, 51. Wow. And because of the delay, because my mother's water had broken, mm-hmm. it was a dry burn. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, now, what is that? There's a dry burn for people who don't really, they aren't familiar with that. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so basically. <laughs> But but my skin was rough, raw, wow, uh, a bit. Mm-hmm. So uh, for like uh, four weeks, six weeks, my mother had to uh, bathe me in uh, fine oil mm-hmm. until I healed. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that's how I came into the world. Wow! Wow! <laughs> In Temple, Texas, gotcha. which is about 25 or 30 plus miles from Fort Hood. Okay, Texas. I don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was that was that was the beginning. Uh, you you had mentioned that you had gotten to radio um, after high school. Uh, yes, mm-hmm. yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, how did I get into radio? Um, black radio. Um, has a history as well mm-hmm. because when radio and television um, evolved um, there weren't at the beginning any minority mm-hmm. uh, radio stations mm-hmm. or community stations it was like most it was a business thing so when this around was the early 70s maybe Hmm. Or mid seventies. I first got into call, got into um, radio in college, which was um, 
It's probably in the early 70s. Yeah, it's got to be. Uh, mm-hmm. And in order to have a license for a new radio station, you had you were licensed by the government. Mm-hmm. You know, a, an individual or community organization could have a radio station mm-hmm. by themselves. They didn't have podcast right, right there. Right, right, right. So you had to get a license mm-hmm. uh, to uh, be uh, speak on the radio, mm-hmm. uh, to be an engineer, mm-hmm. um, to uh, have. Of course, you had to have the money. I mean, technology, but there's some finance that you have to have. Mm-hmm. So there wouldn't want any black radio stations or community stations at that time. At the time. But <clears throat> the elected officials, and that was a, a federal, federal thing, basically said, if you want a license to um, build on a radio station, you needed to have a certain uh, percentage mm-hmm. of minority radio station. Mm-hmm. Now, and people ask, well, why, why should we be going? Now, <laughs> you know, and obviously, they don't know the history, so you know, I'm struggling, so right. you don't know what you're talking about. Right, right, right. But, but anyway, so, um, uh, radio stations uh, were started, and a per- uh, some percentage of them were non-profit, mm-hmm. they were, uh, commercial stations mm-hmm. and those nonprofit stations were generally associated with um, education, gotcha. uh, universities, mm-hmm. colleges, mm-hmm. some educational, established educational relationship. So in that at that time, um, they were beginning to have a African American uh, radio station. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I knew that it was coming, so I got a license. Mm-hmm. And you had to take a test. You can get that in. Just like a driver's license. Mm-hmm. Get certified that I am be a broadcaster. Mm-hmm. That was the, the politics that you real. Yeah, so the certification process. Mm-hmm. So they had to have a minority with the radio station, mm-hmm. black African American mm-hmm. radio station. And so we don't we don't know who or what. So I applied. Another uh, brother, I actually know who it, uh, it was, had also applied. Mm-hmm. So this is our God move. And they would say, yes, with this this the uh, first uh, African American uh, that we let go, and he had the he had a door, he had a key, and I was second in line. Mm-hmm. For some reason, I said, no, I'm, I'm actually leaving the city. I'm go- I think we went to Louisiana. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whatever your family, what, whatever number you have, it's like, oh, hey, do you want to do this? Mm-hmm. Yes, I'm ready to go. I got my license. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, you go ahead and put it together. And so I, I, I initiated um, at that time, the first African American radio station, and uh, just off of oh, BET and Radio One, all these uh, these platforms, as far as <laughs> I did, right, right, at the time, right, right, right. Yeah, deep it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was like um, KPFT, mm-hmm. uh, so there was a national network. network. Mm-hmm. So the radio. Program, mm-hmm. like an interview, just mm-hmm. like you're doing now, mm-hmm. was not only for Houston, but national, gotcha. to their national network. Gotcha. So, in a way, so I produced uh, a radio station interviewing uh, NAACP, Urban League at that time, mm-hmm. those minority organizations, business leaders, mm-hmm. community groups, those kind of things that were important to our community. Mm-hmm. And it was not only in Houston, it was national. Gotcha. And ultimately, uh, I think that 120, 125. Wow. 
cities. And I actually uh, recorded, I still got the most of the records, so the people said, well, I don't believe it. That's fine. <laughs> like, the records. Right. Uh, so that happened. So uh, that's how I got into media. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was important as podcasts are important now. Mm-hmm. And that was radio and hmm, television. Mm-hmm. And interestingly enough, uh, while I was the host and producer, director of the radio, um, uh, maybe you shouldn't be the host. Mm-hmm. But we let you uh, produce, direct, and we're going to start you as an engineer, as an audio engineer. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to do a the Noe program, and this is the African program, we can do this. So I produced and directed and created um, several um, African American. Uh, that's what they used to do with Noe TV stations, the guys just said that they're going to do that in the morning. That's why they have. Yeah, gotcha. right. So it sounded like you were, you, were, you were head of, uh, you were part of the movement without being the movement at, at that time. <laughs> Right, so I was recording and producing and uh, the radio and ultimately the television uh, programs that were uh, providing information to the community about our issues mm-hmm. and, and programs. Yes, gotcha. So, um, t- can you, I guess, how can I put it to you? Can you describe to one just kind of explain to us how the climate was like after King and after Malcolm X was killed and then I think uh, we had uh, Fred Hampton had been killed by then as well, you know, but but to, to jump in that movement and then still push it forward, what 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 inspired you or what made you want to get into the into the movement to, to help out the community? Well, I was born in nineteen fifty one. I'm a, basically a child of the sisters. Mm-hmm. So I was a part of that national reality that African Americans were. I experienced segregation mm-hmm. myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I experienced discrimination. I, um, in my early years, was going to a one room school. Wow. In Hyattenhammer, Texas. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, that was my personal reality, and I'm like many of us, most of us, were attempting and working to change it, mm-hmm. to transform it, mm-hmm. to make it be what it present, uh, present itself as a democracy. Mm-hmm. Um, we weren't uh, uh, allowed to vote. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> All of those kinds of things were historically a part of my life experience. Gotcha. So when you uh, you touched down in Houston, what what year was this? I don't know if I can because first it was Austin. Austin, okay. And my mother and father uh, was also part of that historical experience. Mm-hmm. They chose the path as educators. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mother uh, earned her uh, two masters uh, degrees. Mm-hmm. Uh, one in education, the second in music. Mm-hmm. My father earned a PhD uh, and ended up with a PhD in education. Mm-hmm. And I've actually got his dissertation in, in my in my library. Wow! So that was part of my life experience. My, my, my parents, in their life experience, was you know one of the paths out of slave, slavery um, were. Three things were priorities out of slavery mm-hmm. for our people. Mm-hmm. One was to find and try to connect with members of our family mm-hmm. that had been sold off right. and distributed. And so the family connections were broken mm-hmm. uh, by the political uh, experience. Mm-hmm. And there was an attempt to connect. Uh, slaves weren't allowed and taught how to read mm-hmm. and write. Mm-hmm. So a second priority of uh, our people at a time with 
established schools mm -hmm. and teach our people in our community how to read mm -hmm. and to write. And so my mother and my father were part of that education experience coming mm -hmm. out of segregation. And they didn't start stop with just graduating from school. Mm -hmm. They went up to graduate high level education. My mother actually could have her PhD as well. But she uh, she focused on family mm -hmm. and education too. Um, and music. Gotcha, gotcha. So Austin first and then Houston, you said sites in Houston and um why why Houston? Why because Houston we, we were talking about camera about how certain parts of, of the United States were uh we'll call them power kids, but they were instrumental in a lot of things, a lot of just the corruption in some parts of, of, of the United States and you know, certain parts known for this, some parts known for that, but why Houston Well actually they were they um, they moved to Port Arthur. Yeah, okay, gotcha. And so Port Arthur <laughs> was interesting. And again, we're, we're still dealing with segregation and with, so, but their work was in education mm -hmm. and ultimately toward, my father particularly toward education administration. Mm -hmm. So the educational uh, opportunity toward administration mm -hmm. for him, mm -hmm. Port Arthur. Gotcha. So we, we moved to Port Arthur. And I just remember as we were driving in, I said, uh, damn, what is that smell? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, son, you are you're smelling money. Mm. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you smell it, and we still work. <laughs> and so, um, you know, he and my mother kind of earned their way into, um, I guess, what some people would um, describe as better in income mm -hmm. reality. Gotcha. And I remember when, you know, my family my, uh, earned enough uh, income to build a house, mm -hmm. a new house. Mm -hmm. This is important. Um, eventually, they came to Houston. Okay. But but I remember, um, I think that was important. I remember saying, you know, I want to be, you know, around my people. I know now. I'm saying, you no, know, you're building a house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You need to build it in a residential community where other homes are like this. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Uh, those of us who really have eyes open and a heart mm -hmm. and care mm -hmm. should um, not only should see if not live at least open their eyes to how poverty mm -hmm. is. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. Oh, I got you. And I think to this, uh, mm -hmm. would you want to build a brand new house? Mm -hmm. In a poverty stricken area. Poverty stricken area. Right. Where other houses don't, don't look like that. You're right. Or even close. Right. It's a no. And so point. I got a chance to be the second family living in an integrated neighborhood. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I didn't plan any of this. Right, right, right. And, you know, I didn't even then understand, the, uh, appreciate the significance by the point of this as I do now. Mm -hmm. And so we were the second family in Port Hood, so, so second African-American family mm -hmm. to live in it. And it was not, it, it, we was not no welcoming part party. Of course, you know? of course. But let me see. In the second home, and family, was like, so, which was like, our backyard mm -hmm. is the backyard of that that other black family. Gotcha, okay. Mm -hmm. They, uh, they uh, burned the cross mm -hmm. in uh, that family's neighborhood, mm -hmm. but they stayed there. Mm -hmm. And there was one 
family in particular that I remember that was also in that community. And one, uh, one guy that was about my same age, mm-hmm. and he was uh, Anglo, he was white. Mm-hmm. And we became friends. <laughs> and he just treated me like another human being. Right, right, right. We, we, went, we just growing up right. in junior high school or high, whatever that was, mm-hmm. and, and living and throwing football or whatever, that's it. Right. So understanding we're just human beings mm-hmm. of a different history, family, and background. That's it. So you, you mentioned uh, history and background. You, so you have a, a, an extensive background in history, like, and so I'm trying to peel back a, a little bit of layers, and I get pulled back too much and whatnot. But um, I really want to talk about the movement, how you were instrumental in in, in uh, starting in Buff, and and uh, even when helping, you know, uh, the Safe Center uh, expand their their uh, their reach as far as that and whatnot. But um, and in, in what capacity? Because in, in this, this I don't to my knowledge, I don't know anybody personally who have been targeted by uh, the FBI. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, what, why why do you think that you were that you were targeted? Because evidently you were you were a threat Co- completely, considerably. Because if you get if you get the largest entity that was that was against or to monitor people, especially not just us, but you had the you had, you had Marcus Garvey, you had um Malcolm X, you had all these people being, being investigated. Why do you think that they targeted you on? Well I think they targeted everybody that was in the mm-hmm. And I think the record will um, underscore that. Mm-hmm. Um so I don't I don't think it was me particularly. I think it was uh, every people, all of those who committed to uh, social change, social justice in a non-violent way. Yeah, okay. Because uh, uh, I think the, the, the one of the important and critical decisions that I've made that the social change and social justice mm-hmm. that I would commit to, that I would support, that mm-hmm. I would be involved in would be non-violent. Gotcha. And <clears throat> that is part of my spiritual commitment and work, mm-hmm. but that's the decision that I made. Mm-hmm. And so, um, the 1960s is where another step, the, the, the movement didn't start in the 60s. The movement started in and out of slavery. Mm. I got and you. so got some you. folk who haven't studied the history of our people they, no, it didn't start here. It started, it started on the slavery ships. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm a star. Mm-hmm. Wow. We fought for in more than many ways. Mm-hmm. Fought for and gained our freedom. Mm-hmm and establish our own communities, our own governments, our own leadership, and our own, our own people. <clears throat> and some of us uh, working to reform. Mm-hmm. Now, if you really study uh, the Constitution, uh, Af- African Americans, three-fifths mm-hmm. of the human being right. from the beginning. Mm-hmm. But if you don't study, if you don't Read the books. If you don't know the history of this country, at least uh, you got to know your country, where you live, wherever you live, mm-hmm. and your people, like your family. Mm-hmm. We don't even know our family history Good point. as we should. Right. And we still need to do some more work today. I agree for our families. I so agree. we got a lot of work to do. The third thing we did out of slavery was build. Churches. Mm. And uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the church as well. I agree. As in politics. I agree. And we were denied uh, the opportunity to study or experience 
uh, African tradition, mm -hmm. spirituality. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were taught uh, an experience. What I would just for a time say, white Christianity, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of lies in that also. <laughs> I mean, we don't have time to we, deal we, with we, that. Let's we'll circle back around we'll that. Back yeah, yeah, that. that's a whole podcast in itself. <laughs> but, you know, I've studied many spiritual uh, traditions, mm -hmm. and Christianity is one that, for me, mm -hmm. uh, is the way to go through the Yeah. So, you know, uh, <clears throat> I've, I've followed the Panthers uh, for a little while. You know, I, you know, I'm familiar with Bobby Seale uh, and Huey P. Newton and whatnot. And they I, were not violent. Now. They were, they were, they they were not violent. The, 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 the establishment mm -hmm. uh, has attempted to communicate mm -hmm. uh, to to uh, they that they were not. Violent. No, they just believe that if you're going to shoot me. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have a, 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 some armor on, and I'm gonna be able to prepare myself, to right. defend myself. Right. right. They weren't attempting to take over the country. No. That is revolution. Right. They were into defense, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> there's no historical evidence of any of our people, in particular the Panthers, since you raised it up, attempting to take over. They're trying to just hey, just, in fact, they were feeding. Mm -hmm. The community. The breakfast. Mm -hmm. Now, there was, there was no breakfast at the schools, mm -hmm. at the other schools. Mm -hmm. That started with the Black Panther. That's right, that's right. But, you know, that was the big time. They not only did the breakfast, but they also clothing. Mm -hmm. uh, Sickle cell testing, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, all that, man. Those communities that they could do at that level. Mm -hmm. And the decision was made by the FBI and uh, the political establishment to uh, do all that it could to destroy, mm -hmm. the uh, not reform, mm -hmm. destroy. Right. So uh, in in Bobby Seale's book, Seize the Time, and at the time I didn't know why he did it, but when they had infiltrated the, the Black Panthers, they were like, well, if they're going to infiltrate us, they're going to infiltrate you. So he ran for, I want to say, mayor of, uh, of Oakland, mm -hmm. and uh, he didn't win. So I'm like, man, why, 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 why he went for, for mayor? You know, so... The only thing I, I, I got, I, I realized, okay, well, you can affect change, you can make change on a local level in politics, because that, that's, that's how the money was disseminated, mm -hmm. and the mayor controlled and power. In power, right? So I said, okay, wow, that's smart. And so um, I remembered around about maybe 97, 98, somewhere over there, hearing the name Judon Boney, Judon Boney. You got bony, you know. So I remember hearing it, but I, I didn't watch a lot of TV back then. And, you know, they didn't really have. Hopefully, not in the bad way. Right. Well, I mean, uh, because I'm saying that because, like, right now, uh, the most of the city council uh, uh, meetings are, are you can you can just watch them on TV and things like that. Back then, I'm not I'm not aware if that was around. You know what I mean? And so, but um, I remember hearing your name, and then you were around when. The first black mayor was uh, in there. The mayor Lee Brown was was in, in office and whatnot. So, uh, what made you want to get into into politics? Social change, mm -hmm. social justice. Uh, the political system is, I would suggest, is one, if not the, but definitely one of the primary uh, systems that. Uh, Decisions are made how power and money, uh, opportunities, uh, and work get this done. Mm -hmm. So, and so we, <clears throat> our people, our community, uh, are hurt, uh, destroyed, uh, suffer from all of the system. The human experience is. Uh, economic, mm -hmm. it's politics controls the police. That's true. That's right. Politics controls power. How? Who's going to get a contract? Mm -hmm. Who might have an opportunity to compete for a contract? Mm -hmm. um, that's political. Mm -hmm. uh, who, who, who decides where the, the, the street is going to pay, uh, be paid or repaired? Are there sidewalks in this neighborhood or no? So I get a little like, are there street lights 
uh, in that neighborhood. Well, what are the political leaders who decide or at least help support or attempt to argue or move the money that is, comes from our taxes that we all pay that decides where the uh, lights, the streets, the sidewalks, the development, well, that is the so some of our political representatives, so they say. I don't think they're doing a good job. Mm. I'm not impressed. How can we keep our elected officials uh, accountable? Like, I mean, because right now it's, it seems like that a certain era of people aren't as engaged as it was when the baby boomers were, were uh, making this stuff move, making this shake and whatnot. But the Generation X, we're, we're, to me, Generation X, my generation, we're, we were raised by y'all, by, by the boomers, but then we had kids, and some of the boomers, well, I think they said boomers, said, well, yeah, I don't know. I guess some, some boomers can't say they have some, some, some millennials. <laughs> you know, my mom is a boomer, and my, and my sister is a millennial. So, I don't know. It's like, how, how can we uh, hold these people accountable? Because we see, we're seeing the effects of them not being so effective, you know? Yeah, how, how, how can we hold these people accountable, you know? Because a lot of people are losing um, faith into our elected officials. I think that all of us, each and every one of us, need to honestly look at ourselves. Mm -hmm. In the mm -hmm. personally. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to uh, discuss, assert what somebody else are doing mm -hmm. or what they are doing. If we have not, at least at the same time, if not first, look at ourselves. Mm -hmm. And what, I, what we are doing with ourselves, because mm -hmm. we have some of the same challenges. Um, I only got so much money. Now, back up. I only got so much time. That's right. <laughs> I'm not going to live forever. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to live forever. Mm -hmm. Our energy, our money, our place. Some of us are just doing the best we can to survive right now. Mm -hmm. Some of us are doing the best we can, hopefully as honestly as we can. What can we do to better the condition of our family, mm -hmm. our children, mm -hmm. uh, let's be honest, and we got we got to stop lying to ourselves first, mm -hmm. because if if someone suggests to you, well, I think you. You are the one of Okay. Says, what are you doing? Why don't you run? Mm -hmm. Why don't you help? Right. I don't have no money. Can you pass out some flyers? Mm -hmm. Can you come to a meeting? Mm -hmm. Can you do something other than talk, scratch your butt, playing, watching TV? Good, come on now. I, I'm that one. Yeah. If it comes true. across my desk, I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't ask mm -hmm. to have this thing. You asked to have it with me. I did. Since I have limited time, mm -hmm. I don't feel like lying mm -hmm. or playing. Mm -hmm. I leave that time for my children, mm -hmm. for my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And so, my challenge to those who are listening, I would ask each of us, look at ourselves. What are we doing with our lives? What are we doing? Do we think we were just born to have fun? Mm -hmm.
definitely want to give a shout out to Political Street, man. That's one of the coldest names you can have. <laughs> because we out here in these streets, yeah. but these politics is trickling down, so it's all intertwined, man. So we got to figure out how to work with the way we work. So shout out to Political Street.